OK, so um, this talk is about using metadata and decentralized applications, um, something that has been called semantic Ethereum. And um, uh, if you're, if, uh, well, I guess I'll start with who am I. I'm Jamie Pitts. I help out at the Ethereum Foundation. Um, at one time, I was very much a fan of the semantic web. Um, and uh, it went on for a long time, and then I discovered Ethereum. So I'm very I'm happy that that changed. Um, but I still, I still, it's in my heart. The semantic web is a very interesting effort. Um, a lot of resources went into it. And I think we can learn from it, even though it didn't quite pan out um, the way that Tim Berners-Lee wanted it to pan out. So um, if you're going to start about talking about semantic web, you should start talking about metadata. And um, this is, ironically, the Google Infobox definition. Um, it's data that describes other data. Simple as that. Um, we often use it in our web applications, but um, you know, we might use it for SEO purposes. But there's a real depth to it, and there's, there's a real theory behind it. And there's a world of developers, and especially standards developers, um, working on it, as particularly with the W3C. Um, and the notion is that there's just, it, it just goes deeper and deeper, and data can be connected together to everything else. Um, so the, the Semantic Web was this visionary project by Tim Berners-Lee in the aughts. And um, I think he first wrote about it or initiated it in 1999, 2000, thereabouts. Um, and so the, the thing about Tim Berners-Lee, he developed the original web. And so because he did that, you know, there's a tendency, at least in my heart, to, to really listen to what he has to say. And so I really tuned in. I'm like, this is very interesting stuff. So he started with the current web, and he said, we can, we can take just what's content and actually turn it into data, and that we know who posted this data, and that's a web of trust. You can, you can form trust, and you can um, analyze that data knowing the source of that data. Um, and then in the deeper level, it's a web of meaning, that um, some meaning can be derived from it, and all, a whole world of services can can emerge from there. Um, and it, the effort has been going on for a long time, and it's still going on. They're still working on it. Um, and so um, a key aspect is to establish ontologies, which is how, um, structuring the information, um, especially relationships between different kinds of objects. It's really similar to how you would design a database in, in a web application. Um, and the key is once you've established ontologies, you publish data about those ontologies in a normal web or otherwise. And uh, that data would refer to the ontology. So that if you have a person, that person would, that, that, um, that data would refer to the onto ontological information about the person. So you can, you can reason about it. Um, and obviously, this is not for normal users. Like, you and I are not going to be browsing the semantic web enjoying that unless we really have an appetite for pain. Um, but it, it, it's really for machines. Um, and essentially, the, all, all, of the, all these relationships, which are loose, they're not enforced, um, the relationships between all these points of data, because it's all over the web, it could create a gigantic graph database. And if you think about Google, what Google does, it saw the web itself as a, a graph. And, and that's the origin of its success. And uh, the, the notion is that that if you release this, publish this data, the entire web could become a database. No index on that database, but um, that's the job of aggregators. And you can see from this diagram how things might be connected. And it can get, it just, it could just go on and on and on as things refer to each other. Um, so here's a cool standard. It's called Sparkle. And it, it, it's published by the W3C. And it's how you can query this graph data um, in a SQL-like manner. It's, you know, you can see from it, it's not elegant like SQL, but it's kind, of, it's kind of alluring to see that. And I was really interested in that when it came out. Now, there's a conundrum to this. Um, when you loosely declare stuff, it, it's ambiguous. Um, but if you go really deep on describing things, that's very burdensome for developers. It's burdensome for normal people. 
to create these ontologies, to create this, this data. Um, and, uh, and obviously the semantic web did not go big. It didn't take over the universe. It didn't become anything like the phenomenon that we're wrapped up in. Um, and, but, but the thing is it developed all these standards, lots and lots of standards, um, some of them very, very ornate, um, but no, no, nothing that a user would know, hey, this is the semantic web I'm using, right? Unless you're like a domain expert. Um, and there's a famous um, uh, article written by Cory Doctorow that calls it meta crap. And he just goes into how, um, because of the, the nature of human beings declaring this data, there's going to be lies, inaccuracies, all those things. All those things we're quite used to on the internet in general. And so he, you know, he's a big doubt. He's a big doubter of this. Um, but the thing is, metadata is widespread. If you're a web developer, you know you're constantly thinking about it for SEO purposes and just in general to be a good citizen. Um, so here's a couple of good examples of, of actual semantic web standard data being used. When you get your email um, about your airline ticket, Gmail is actually interpreting semantic web uh, standard data and rendering that. And even GitHub actions, those little actions there, um, Google has published a way that you can, using semantic web standards, um, create a GitHub style, those, those little nice drop downs. And of course, Google has these info boxes, which are kind of controversial Wikipedia like info boxes that comes from harvested. Um, semantic web data. So if you think about when it, W3C standards are called recommendations, so what do they provide? What, is, what do these recommendations um, provide? One is linkage. Um, things are linked together. And you know, you think about a link on a web page, you know, pretty much universally we'll know what that is. Um, but there's a specific way semantic web data or metadata links to other data, link refers to that ontology, refers to other related data. Um, so that's linkage. Another one is descriptive, um, descriptive meaning. That's a second um, thing it provides. Another key is structural meaning. You can actually create an ontology that has all these special relationships and just gets extremely ornate. It's like uh, you can just get lost in it and you can to find something in the real world with just ex, you know, excruciating level of detail of a potential object, and it's invalid. Like you could define uh, ontology for microphones, and you could just go to town on that. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure somebody has developed an ontology for microphones um, for an industry-specific application. Now, it, if you do these things, if you have those th three things it provides, what does it lead to? Um, it, you know, as a publisher, you have lots of options. Um, the data is structured, so it's much more easy to aggregate. Google's advantage um, in any search engine is they just have huge engineering resources, huge computational power, you know, they, and they apply statistics and they can analyze things. And that's because the, the data that they're analyzing is so messy. And that's how, you know, that's a big part of their, their power position, in my opinion. Um, it, being that the semantic web data is might be there. It, it creates a, a potential value chain, much like an Ethereum ecosystem that we see in contracts. The semantic web was potentially going to like, you can layer new interesting things on top of it, um, and then new services coming from that. Um, and so how does, how does metadata do this? How, how does semantic web standard data do this? Highly formalized assertions. So like, OK, you're going to make some metadata about a microphone. Uh, you know, you're going to assert like, OK, that's uh, colored black, that's plastic, that's this and that. Like, all these different facts about it, those are assertions. And those will be structured. Um, uh, the data format is called RDF. It's a graph. It has a really special format. It's mentally taxing to, to even grok RDF. Like, it's very mentally, it's very interesting. It's, I, would, I would recommend it, but not to develop in it. Um, and it's layered on top of the current web. Tim Berners-Lee wanted it to be decorating the current web, like a layer, so, so it, it can piggyback on the current web. And it has been doing that. Like, if you open up any web page and look at the source, 
There's tons of that metadata all throughout that thing, either declared as a block of, of, of some data or inside the HTML tags. It's just, it's just woven in there, and you can kind of see it, you know, how it's um, assign, like um, annotating, annotating what's in the web page, like tables of data. Um, now, one thing about semantic web data that's really interesting is, uh, say, an AP, like an API has a rigidity about it. Um, you know, you expect a, a, an API to have these results, and it's going to be like person and have these fields. Semantic web data allows you to express all kinds of concepts as long as you're referring to the, ontolo the, the uh, ontological aspect properly. You can, ex you can mix in all kinds of data. You have a person, and you can put a dog in there. You can just put all kinds of stuff in there, and the aggregator could be able to in a comprehensible way, query that data, even though it's just completely mixed up with all kinds of different objects. That's why, that's why it's so excruciating in terms of needing stru like structure for that data. So here, I'll, I'll give you an example that's kind of fun. There's, a, um, there's a, some people at Stanford a couple of years ago, I can't figure it out if they did it um, you know, just to kind of be mean-spirited or if they just did it for fun. It's a, semantic, it's a pizza ontology. And uh, if you just Google pizza ontology, it's there. It's huge. It's just like pages and pages of XML. And it just describes everything a pizza could do and still be a valid pizza. So if you took a hamburger, there's no way it's going to comply with the pizza ontology because it doesn't have like all these properties, all these relationships between objects like cheese and toppings and stuff. So that's a, so we'll, make, we'll use semantic pizza because it's a little bit fun and this stuff is really excruciating. Um, so thinking about linkage, um, one key thing about linkage is a resource that's always there. And this is one key thing about Ethereum that we have this great advantage. Um, you know, we, we have a permanency here. And the current web, like so much semantic, data, semantic web data, web pages, everything just vanish within a couple of years. Once that business goes out of business, poof, you know. But there's potential for our ecosystem to provide the permanency, permanent linkage. Um, and so here's, a, here's some things you might be familiar with from HTML. You see these XML namespaces. This is how you refer to things um, with semantic web data. And you can see this is, um, this is RDF right here. Um, I don't even want to go into why, how RDF is structured and why it does what it does. But this kind of gives you a notion that it's, that it's linking to things out there. And you can see how it's defining these namespaces um, like uh, you see there, um, uh, you see there. There's pizza referring to the location of pizza owl, which is an ontology. An owl follows an ontology, um, and so if you go to that location, you'll just see this giant chunk of text of of the pizza ontology. Uh, so you think of um, descriptive meaning, um, types and properties. You know, much like a database, ob you know, a database table. Um, so think about assertion about Los Angeles. This is the RDF format. It comes in triples. And so Los Angeles um, is a type of city. Um, this is how you would tell a semantic web data, like aggregator or query about like Los Angeles is a city. That, that thing in the middle there, you have, you, have to, you have to say it this way in RDF. Now, here's an ontological assertion about pizza. A topping. Is, is, a, is a property or ingredient of a pizza. Um, and there's actually, I would, I'm certain somewhere in that pizza ontology is a line in RDF that, look, that says that. Um, so um, here, this is, um, this, is, this is a chunk of XML that would, would talk about descriptive meaning. Um, there's actually like a schema describing the notion of type. There's, a, you know, there's, there's schemas for everything in the semantic web. Everything you can imagine, you know, starting with, you know, there's probably even one for nothing, nothingness. Um, so structural meaning, the relationships between these different objects that we've described. Um, so I'll take, I'll take one that's a little more exotic, transitive property of ingredients. So the ingredients of ingredients are ingredients of the whole. And, you know, with pizza, like, who cares, right? But, um, you know, if you're writing, 
if, if you're writing an application, you want vali you know, vali valid data to happen. Um, this, is a this, this comes in handy. And um, so th there's, um, in, in this OWL standard, there's tons and tons of these sorts of things, like transitive property. And it all stems from um, that field of, of uh, uh, what, I don't even know the name of it, onto ontological studies. There's, there's a field of study for this stuff, and they have an, a whole world of vocabulary for it. Um, and so reasoning with the transitive property. So this is a kind of pizza that's fun in Asia. They have, and like Taiwan and Japan, they have these pizzas. And it's crazy. It's like the crust actually has little hot dogs. And there's like little, uh, there's little ketchups on top of the hot dogs. I can't believe people would eat this thing. But um, this is a really good example of transitive property. It's a ketchup on hot dogs, an ingredient of the pizza. If you would like to compute that, if you'd like to prove that, um, the semantic web makes it possible. Um, and you know, of course, you go through the reasoning, and uh, yeah, you can prove it that you know this simple thing right here that this strange pizza is still a pizza. It's a pizza even though it's got hot dogs and ketchup, and the ketchup is an ingredient of the whole pizza because of that. And you know, this is just like one of those tiny little corners of the semantic web that you know kind of illustrates the ornateness of this whole initiative. Um, and there's no way that we're going to do that. And, and you know that might be why it failed. Um, and but but the thing is, this person uh, Manu Sporni came along, and he he really was a critic of the difficulties of this. And um, he actually worked on standards of the W3C for many years. And um, he ca he came up he came up with an alternative. And he's a founder of Digital Bazaar as well, by the way. So he's a very interesting person. And so he wants to reform RDF. He, he, um, he would like to add this, this, um, this ability um, without, without all the work. And so he developed this thing called JSON-LD. And JSON-LD is very much more accessible than the ornate RDF, as interesting as it is. Developers can kind of deal with this. All you have to do is put this context in there, and it's a little bit different, but you can get the same sort of, the sorts of expressiveness um, without going all the way, just enough. And so this is much more accessible for normal web developers, and I think that this is an opportunity for Ethereum to actually participate in, and construct something along the lines of a semantic web. Um, and so why would we do this? Why would we, why would we use this, fa this, not failed, but, um, not known to the public and not fully expressing Tim Berners-Lee's full vision of, of what he wanted to do. Why would we use this? So the key is our data in our systems that we're going to be building is potentially forever. And um, you know you don't want it. You, you, you have to think to the future. And you have to think that the, you know, people are going to be looking at this and trying to figure out what you're trying to do. And the weirder your solution, the less conformant to standards it is, the more difficult it is going to be in the future. Um, and you can cooperate on uh, developing these ontologies. If you have very lightweight ontologies, you can work with other developers, and then you don't have to keep redoing the same stuff in, in, the, in the various DAP um, objects that you're dealing with, users and all these other things. Um, and, the, and the key, especially with Ethereum, because it has the trust, it has so many of these features that weren't present um, when Tim Berners-Lee was um, coming up with Semantic Web, um, we can, we're, I mean, we're almost, we're, we're developing ecosystems so rapidly, it's amazing. But if we had more structure, we could do, we could do so much more. Um, and one interesting thing about Ethereum is we have tons of metadata already. And, you know, ERC-20 is a really good one, um, ERC-735. Um, you know, even documentation, that's descriptive metadata. Um, and the key about structural, like in, in the semantic web, there's, there's um, ways to validate. But in our system, it's, it's much more rigid, and that's a good thing. Um, they're either forced by the EVM or they're enforced by your dApps. Um, and so, uh, like, how, how might we go about it? How, um, I, I would, I mean, just th obviously think about it. Just go light, um, just go light on it. Um, you know, stick with things that developers are, that's accessible to developers. 
Um, and one key thing that was really bothering me like in the last couple of weeks before I, I'm giving this now is like how do you incentivize people to do this? It's more work. And um, if there's something here, it's going to be from that, um, those additional new layers. And because of, the, because of Ethereum itself, you can get, um, you can get paid. And that's going to be very interesting. The, the future ecosystem built on top of your thing, you get, you get revenue from that. Um, and so like the key recommendations, let's stop repeating, like reinventing all these different common objects, create schemas um, that, are, that are known and shared. And there's this schema.org, it's a really interesting resource. Basically they've packed it in with all kinds of common common use objects, and um, Jason LD very commonly refers to it, many semantic or metadata things refer to it, and uh, this is fun to browse, there's all kinds of things. I don't think there's pizza in there. They, they missed that one. Um, and so, and obviously um, with, um, with Swarm, uh, put the Jason LD on Swarm and then refer to it in contracts. And the Jason LD in, sw in Swarm uh, just have them refer back, back and forth to each other between the contract and Swarm, the data on Swarm. And, um, you know, thing, you, can, you can get the, the highly structured benefit, more expensive benefit of contracts, and then just the immense storage capacity of Swarm and IPFS. Um, and so, like, you think about these, the, the lessons, um, I guess I'm repeating myself, don't burden the developers. Um, build things for ecosystems. Um, and take a look at the W3C standards. There's many of them, and they are a little bit of a, you know, rabbit hole. Like, one, some of these standards, like OWL, you go down the OWL rabbit hole like I did back in 2000, whenever. And, you know, I didn't come out for a while. You know, I wouldn't recommend it too much, but I think it's very important to go and review what's already been done out there, as opposed to just kind of like, hey, I'm just gonna build this thing and, you know, like someone's else gonna build the same thing or practically in a different way. Learn from the greats. And they did a lot of great things. They overdid it, but they did a lot of great things. Um, so that's it. If you guys have any questions, I'm, I'm interested. Um, yeah, I built this presentation in HTML, by the way. It's kind of cool reveal. Um, so that's it. Um, yeah, you were you were talking about uh, Schema.org and uh, to build Ethereum's Schema.org. Uh, how would it how would it be different? And uh, how would you uh, where do you publish uh, the Schema of uh, of your metadata? Yeah, you would create a swarm resource for schemas. Like you would just pack. Like a, I would I would say I would see that you'd create a system of contracts um, so that you could version um, different schemas that you would develop. And uh, you can host all the schemas in, in, as JSON-LD or as just OWL files, traditional OWL, file, OWL like ontology files. And you just put it on Swarm, put it on IPFS. And you could just mirror schema.org and then just encourage people to refer to it. Like if they're going to declare person, make sure they say this is a person according to schema ETH schema.eth, or whatever it's going to be. And so that's what I would think. It would just be filled with lots of ontology documents. And then contracts to maintain that system um, for versioning and you know, just uh, control. <laughs>